the lecture is being live streamed now. Good day, I'm Professor Mabuto Sibanda, the Dean and Head of School of Accounting, Economics and Finance. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nanapoku, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Harold Ngalawa. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Harold Ngalawa. The Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Menege Reddy conveys her apologies and congratulates Professor Harold Ngalawa on his promotion and thanks him for the contribution to the School of Accounting, Economics and Finance. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. Inaugural lectures present an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an ac academic's career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. These lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contribution to their field, to academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural, inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. I would like to acknowledge the following guests, members of the executive management, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Harold Ngalawa, family and friends of Professor Ngalawa, academics and professional staff, students, alumni and distinguished guests. A special welcome to our guests from universities and organizations in South Africa, from the African continent and globally. Distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to now formally introduce the inaugural Professor Harold Ngalawa. Harold Ngalawa is a professor of economics and chairperson of the Macroeconomics Research Unit in the School of Accounting, Economics and Finance at the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. He has also taught economics at the University of Malawi. Before joining the academia, Harold worked as a bank economist at the Commercial Bank of Malawi Limited, and later 
as head of research at the Continental Discount House Limited in Malawi. Harold holds a PhD in economics from the University of Cape Town and a Master of Arts in Economics from the University of Malawi. He is also a certified associate of the Institute of Bengals in South Africa. Harold's research interests include monetary theory and practice, structural asymmetries and policy failure, deposit insurance, banking instability, and indigenous finance. He's a co-author of a book titled Secret Kingdoms, De Beers, Botswana, and the Global Diamond Market. He's also a co-editor of two books published by Pelgrave, Macmillan, and Oxford University Press, and many articles published in local and international journals. The title of Harold's lecture today is Informal Financial Markets and Monetary Policy in Quasi Emerging Market Economies. I now invite the inaugurant, Professor Harold Ngalawa, to deliver the lecture. Thank you so much, Professor Sivanda, for your kind words. The Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of KwaZulu Natal, Professor Nana Poku in absentia. The Deputy Vice Chancellor of the College of Law and Management Studies, Professor Mana Gairedi in absentia. The Dean and Head of School of Accounting, Economics and Finance, Professor Mabuto Sibanda. The Registrar of the University of KwaZulu Natal, Professor Dr. Mathe Kathy Crerand. Council and Senate chamber members present here, Deputy Vice Chancellors, Deans and Heads of Schools, College Deans of Research and College Deans of Teaching and Learning, distinguished fellow academics, professional services staff, friends, relatives, neighbors, and members of my family. I am tempted here to also acknowledge my wife, Alice, my son, Zimata, and my daughter, Tandem. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm humbled to be here this afternoon to present my inaugural lecture. I'm particularly honored to talk about indigenous economics, a subject that I'm very passionate about. And before I go any further, let me pay tribute to the man that introduced me to the elements of this subject, Professor Chinyamata Chibeta. I was introduced to indigenous economics in the first year of my undergraduate studies in economics by Professor Chibetan. At the time, his peers regarded him as a rebel in orthodox economics. Many of them did not share his views. Professor Chibetan argued among many other things that the concept of supply and demand may not exist in many African economies, that banknotes and coins are not the only forms of money in the indigenous economies of Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And that elements of indigenous economics are embedded in the tradition and customary values of the people of these economies. Professor Chipeta has published extensively and his most famous publication is titled, Indigenous Economics, A Cultural Approach. As I stated earlier, I had the privilege to learn conventional economics side by side with indigenous economics during my undergraduate studies. Unfortunately, only a small part of our Economics 101 comprised indigenous economics. However, it's been that small part that has remained a part of me for many years. Fast forward several years after my first encounter with Professor Chipeta, I found myself studying under a man who still refers to himself as an accidental African economist. He was born in Italy, studied in the United Kingdom, worked for a short while in France and the Netherlands, married in Durban, briefly taught in Cape Town, and settled in Pretoria. 
He is presently the South African Reserve Bank Chair of Monetary Economics and Head of Economics Department at the University of Pretoria. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly allow me to pay homage to my mentor, Professor Nicola Viergi. Some of the work that I'll be presenting this afternoon was co-authored with Professor Viergi. Now, my presentation this afternoon is going to take the following format. I'm going to start with an outline of background information. Then I'm going to talk about how the formal financial sector and the informal financial sector interact in quasi-emerging market economies and the associated implications for monetary policy. Now we define quasi-emerging market economies as low-income countries that are characterized by weak monetary and fiscal institutions and the formal financial sector that coexists with a large informal financial sector. So you're going to notice that along the way, I am going to use the terms quasi-emerging market economies and low-income economies interchangeably. Uh, the, the, after that, I'm going to talk about um, an innovative approach of uh, generating informal financial sector data using bits and pieces of existing data, indigenous knowledge, and methods, uh, a method suggested by Milton Friedman on how to generate uh, missing data. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, the monetary policy implications of excluding informal financial data in official monetary data. Now, one distinguishing feature uh, of quasi-emerging market economies is the segmentation of uh, the financial system into the formal financial sector and the informal financial sector. And within these two broad segments, there are several types of operators that usually have very little contact with one another and whose contact, uh, whose clients often do not overlap. And where these clients overlap, they're able to sort out which aspects of their financial transactions are going to be handled by which uh, market, whether the informal financial sector or the formal financial sector. Now we define informal finance as legal but unregulated financial activities that take place outside official financial institutions and they're not directly controlled by the monetary authorities. And encompassed in this definition uh, is the mobilization and lending of financial resources by friends, relatives, neighbors, grocers, local merchants, traders, landlords, tenants, grain millers, money lenders, savings and credit cooperatives, rotating and non-rotating savings and credit associations, and microfinance generally. And while some of these uh, institutions are registered, some of, most of them are unregistered, uh, but they are generally protected by the law, most especially in the economy that we're going to concentrate on, which is the economy of Malawi. Now, the informal financial sector, uh, as I said, it's, in, it's known for its fragmentation in many subsectors or what we refer to as also small credit islands. And you're going to notice that if you go into the informal financial sector, uh, the village merchant is likely to uh, provide credit to people that buy regularly from his shop, uh, while the landlord is also likely to provide loans to his workers, and friends, relatives, and neighbors are also likely to lend to each other. So effectively, you find out that uh, the credit market is broken into these distinct small credit islands. However, there is no reason for us to believe that these credit islands are mutually exclusive you may find out that um, people that transact with the, uh, the village merchant also transact with the landlord. So you have uh, an interlocking space between the two segments. And you, also, you may also find out that people that transact among friends, relatives, and neighbors would also transact with uh, the village merchant and the landlord. And uh, each of the different market segments, you may find several um, interlocking spaces. And this makes the concept of market fragmentation within the informal financial sector very complicated. Now, in terms of size of the informal financial sector, 
according to the International Monetary Fund, uh, it consists about a third um, uh, of GDP if you look at the economies in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, as well as uh, South Asia. It's so much so that uh, the International Monetary Fund calls this informal financial sector the hidden third or the missing third. So it's quite a relatively large uh, size. And if you put together low income economies, you find out that um, the contribution of the informal financial sector to GDP is somewhere between 35 and 40 percent. According to Derichat and Medina, uh, about 2 billion workers or 60 percent of the world's employed population aged 15 years and older are presently spending at least part of their time in the informal financial sector. Now, for many years, um, many scholars have uh, perceived the informal financial sector as an economic ill or as a bad that's responsible for exploiting poor people in the quasi-emerging market economies. And the most common policy prescription has been uh, to integrate the informal financial sector with the formal financial sector. Effectively, this means uh, the expectation is that players in the informal financial sector will get registered, they're going to pay tax, and then they're going to have um, audited accounts. But this simply shows a lack of understanding of what actually the informal financial sector is. Now, if you move uh, to the present, you find out that the, there has recently been more and more research that indicate that the informal financial sector is actually an important element of the economies as a whole. And there are quite a number of studies uh, that have indicated uh, that uh, there is a study that was done by Chipeta and Nkandawiri uh, in the case of Malawi, who argued that the informal financial sector in Malawi is an important, plays an important role in alleviating economic hardships among low-income groups by enabling these groups to mobilize resources, use these resources to earn income and obtain loans. And then there is another study that was done by Stu et al um, on the economies of Ghana, Malawi, Nigeria, and Tanzania. And they argue again that the informal financial sector in these countries is an important vehicle for mobilizing savings and financing for small businesses. And more specifically, they argue that the informal financial sector carries out this function using specialized techniques that address the problem of information asymmetry and transaction costs, as well as risks, which prevent banks from saving uh, this market segment, that's the informal financial sector. And then we have another study also that we are aware of that has uh, talked about similar issues on Kenya, and that was done by Atieno. Now, given the large size of the informal financial sector uh, in low-income economies, and then the expected role that it plays on these economies, we now start asking important questions that have uh, profound policy implications. So for example, we ask, are the formal and informal financial markets competitive or complementary? Is the informal financial sector independent or it's driven by the formal financial sector activities? And number three, how do the two markets interact if they interact at all? And we also ask, how is monetary policy affected by the interaction of the two markets? Now, we started off um, with a study where what we did was to put together what in economics would be referred to as a laboratory economy. So this is basically a theoretical model where you um, put together the different markets and the different sectors within the economy. You don't use actual data, but you model um, uh, the different sectors in such a way that they mimic the actual behavior uh, of these actual economies. And this is what's sometimes in economics referred to as dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Now, in our model, we have uh, four sectors. We have households, uh, firms, financial intermediaries and authority and, and, and monetary authorities. Now, 
Um, the firms are the source of production. Uh, the households, um, they, they provide labor to the firms for, for, for production purposes. And then the monetary authorities, we generalize them as the central bank, uh, while the financial intermediaries, we separate that uh, to money lenders and commercial banks. Now, besides that, the business that's uh, money lending itself uh, is run by individual person. You find out that uh, usually it's run without official registration. And as such, it's very difficult to isolate money lending as uh, an activity from the household. Um, uh, so, so we, what we do is to put it together uh, with the household, separating it from the um, official financial institution, but it remains part of the financial intermediaries. Uh, we describe the household's uh, credit function as money lending, and we reserve the term money lenders for credit institutions within the informal financial sector. So effectively, we use the term money lenders as a blanket reference to all creditors in the informal financial sector, including money lenders themselves. Um, and, and, and then it blankets as well uh, other players that include traders, uh, landlords, estate owners, grain millers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look at the household, um, the household uses its financial resources to buy consumption goods that are basically bought from the firms. And then it's uh, some of the financial resources are held as cash balances and the remainder are deposited into uh, commercial banks. And then part of that as well is given out as loans to small scale uh, enterprises. Now that's going back to the firms. Now we assume as well that the firms uh, produce output using capital and they obtain this capital uh, by converting loans uh, into capital. Yeah, so the, the, the firms will get loans from the commercial banks as well as uh, uh, the households. Now the loans from the households are what we have referred to as uh, lending by the informal financial sector, while they lend, the loans from the commercial banks is the lending from the uh, formal financial sector. So they, they use these loans, convert the loans into capital, and then use the capital to produce goods and services. Uh, besides the capital, the firms also hire labor from the households, and then they combine the capital and labor to produce goods and services. Now we assume that when they're going on the market to obtain loans, the firms self-selectively decide whether they're going to obtain loans from the formal financial sector or from the informal financial sector. So they separate into two. Um, some self-selectively seek loans from the formal financial sector, while some self-selectively seek loans from the informal uh, financial sector. Now, we assume as well that we have um, high risk firms and low risk firms. So we define high risk firms as firms with a low probability of converting their loans into capital and low risk firms as firms that have a high probability of converting the loans into capital. Now, on the part of the formal financial sector, we assume that they prefer to give out loans to low risk uh, firms. But the problem that they face is that when the firms come seeking loans in the um, commercial banks, they disguise themselves as low risk firms. So they, everybody else presents themselves as low risk firms. And then uh, the, the commercial banks at the end of the day, they're not sure which of the firms seeking loans from them are actually informal, uh, are actually low risk firms or high risk firms. So at the end of the day, the behavior of the commercial banks is to ration credit to uh, the firms. And then they assume that all the players, that's all the firms seeking loans from the 
uh, former financial sector are high risk borrowers. So they take this as a safe position where they simply assume they're all high risk and then provide a uh, ration credit. At the end of the day, we find out that some firms seeking loans from the former financial sector end up not getting the loans because of this rationing uh, process. Now, remember, at the beginning of the day, what the firms did was to self-selectively seek loans either from the formal financial sector or from the informal financial sector. Now, those seeking loans from the formal financial sector end up in a situation where uh, some are able to get the loans, some are not able to get the loans. Those that are not able to get the loans, now they go to the informal financial sector. And then together with those that have self-selectively sought uh, loans from the informal financial sector, they're both given uh, funds by the informal financial sector. Now, similarly, the informal financial sector, they're also interested in clients that are low risk. And the difference between them and the commercial banks is that they're able to identify the risk levels of their clients with a relatively high degree of certainty. Why? Because the assumption is that they deal with clients from uh, that, that operate within their lo lo locality. Uh, so they're able to provide loans to uh, these people. Now, in terms of the monetary authorities, which we refer to here as the central bank, they basically have two different kinds of tools uh, interest rates and money supply. Previously, we would talk, also talk about exchange rates, but exchange rates are not popular anymore because of uh, the liberalization process that took place around the 1980s and 1990s, so much so that um, it's very rare to find countries that target exchange rates. So they end up using uh, interest rates or money supply as monetary policy tools in order to achieve uh, monetary policy goals. Now, when we put together our model, are trying to understand how uh, the formal financial sector is going to interact with the informal financial sector, we end up with these results. Now, it's quite interesting that uh, what you see here is we're referring to this as the bank rate or what's referred in some countries as the repo rate. And when the central bank increases uh, the bank rate or the repo rate, we see that base lending rates increase immediately. And then the demand uh, for loans, that's for more financial sector loans, decline. Now that's expected. And because there's a decline in demand for formal financial sector loans, because the cost of borrowing has gone up, we find out that uh, cap capital formation declines. And because capital formation has declined, uh, production by the firms also decline. Uh, and if you to trace the increase um, in the bank rate or the repo rate through another route, uh, you find out that in the immediate term, uh, expected prices increase, and then households respond to the expected uh, to the increase in expected prices by adjusting their consumption down. And then, because of that, we observe that expected sales by the firms decline as well. Now, whether you're tracing it from that route or that route, either way, production declines. And when production declines, the firms also respond by cutting back on employment. Uh, and, and wages as well. And some of the lenders, remember, uh, the money lending activity is, has been embedded within the household uh, framework. Uh, so with a decline in employment and a decline in wages, uh, the household has, has fewer financial resources. And what we see is a decline in the supply of informal financial sector loans. And at the same time, because of the reduced production, the banks also demand uh, less informal financial sector loans. But what we saw in the model was that um, uh, the demand for informal financial sector loans decreased by a large margin than uh, the decline in the uh, supply of informal financial sector loans, so much so that we observed a decline in informal financial sector interest rates. Now, there are some take home uh, issues in this framework. Number one, uh, the inc we observe that the increase in the repo rate results in a decline uh, in formal financial sector 
uh, interest uh, loans as well as informal financial sector loans. So what we observe is that both the formal and informal financial sector loans are changing in the same direction. Uh, following a change in the uh, in the in the bank rate or the repo rate, what that means is that they are complementary. Now, when we say they're complementary, effectively, what that means is that when there's uh, let's say an increase in formal financial sector loans, that results in an increase in productive capacity within the informal financial sector. Th sorry, within the informal sector, that requires additional lending that can only be done by the informal financial sector in order to retain or to keep the economy within some equilibrium level. So that's uh, number one. Number two, we observe that if you track uh, what's going on here, um, when the repo rate changes, the lending rates in the formal financial sector increase while the lending rates in the informal financial sector uh, decrease. Um, now, here, we, we notice that the interest rates in the two financial sectors are changing in opposite directions, which is an interesting, an interesting thing, but we're going to talk about this in a little more detail. So, uh, we, fr fr from that, we come up with some interesting conclusions. Number one, that uh, the formal financial sector and the formal financial sector loans may be substitutes as, as we indicated, if you recall, the borrowers would self-selectively either seek loans in the formal financial sector or in the informal financial sector. But if you put them as an aggregate, they tend to be a complement. And we also observe that informal financial sector interest rates are not necessarily driven by formal financial sector interest rates. Now, in, our, in this particular case, um, uh, a change in the in the bank rate or the repo rate re resulted in uh, a change in the uh, formal financial sector low interest rates in one direction and the informal financial sector loans in a completely different direction. We also experimented with a productivity shock. A productivity shock is simply an improvement in uh, technology that leads to improvement and improvement in productivity of uh, labor. And we found out that uh, when this happens, interest rates change uh, in the same direction in both sectors. So we have formal financial sector interest rates increasing uh, and informal financial sector interest rates increasing as well. We also experimented with the risk factor uh, shock um, by, uh, where we would, for instance, increase um, uh, the risk factor for either high risk borrowers or low risk borrowers. And we observed in this particular case that the interest rates were changed in the formal and informal financial sector were changing in different directions. Now, so far, what's evident is that um, in the, the formal and informal financial sectors interact in ways that may not be obvious. And the problem that we face is that if you go into these quasi-emerging market economies, you find out that they do not use informal financial sector data. And the reason they do not use the informal financial sector data is uh, because that data is not there to begin with. And in the cases where the data is there, uh, you find out that it may be from once off service. And in cases where you have more than um, one survey, you may find that the data is um, uh, uh, in service that occur at irregular intervals. Now, these countries end up in a situation where they simply consider formal financial sector data. And the implication is that what they end up reporting as the cost of credit is incorrect. What they end up reporting as the volume of credit is also incorrect. And at the end of the day, um, the policymakers tend to have wrong expectations on the impact of monetary policy on economic activities. So we suggest as a solution um, uh, that's in the immediate term, uh, a generation of data or creation of data, um, what we call data interpolation. Now, the question that we ask here is, what is data interpolation? Now, data interpolation is simply a situation where you have data for any two points, and then you have missing data in between, and then it's simply a process of generating the missing observations. 
Now, in our proposal, we where we use Malawi as a case study, uh, we use two survey data sets. So that's uh, number one, the Chipeta and Kandawiri data set uh, that was compiled in 1989, and then the integrated household survey that was uh, compiled in 2005. And then we also use elements of custom and traditional values. And then we employ uh, principles of the of the Friedman's method of interpolating time series from related series. And then we, we end up with a time series from um, the period that the Chipeta and Kandawiri survey was collected, that's 1988, to the period that the integrated household survey was collected, that is in 2005, and our data is in monthly series. The question we ask here is, should we be worried that we're doing this, we're creating data in this format? And the answer is simply no. Uh, the reason we shouldn't be worried is that uh, this is done anyway for most of the macro data that are used. So most of the macroeconomic time series that are used tend to be constructed out of bits and pieces that are uh, put together, shaped and reshaped, arranged and rearranged uh, to come up with the series that we, we usually work with. And the method that they use is usually uh, data interpolation. So the, how do we do this? I'm going to explain briefly here how this is done. Uh, so we have observations from the Chipeta and Kandawiri survey at one point in 1988-89, and then we have uh, the IHS-2 uh, in 2005. And then what we do, what, 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 what we do is to uh, interpolate in form of financial sector credit first, and then we'll talk about interpolation of in form of financial sector interest rates. So we start off by uh, with a linear interpolation of the data. What that means is you are simply assume that the data changes from um, what were the initial values to what were the final values following a straight line. And then next we split all these observations. Now we have so many observations, monthly time series from 1988 to 2005. Then we split them uh, into agricultural and non-agricultural components. So we end up having agricultural credit and non-agricultural credit. Now, one thing that we know for sure is that the, did, um, the observations do not change from 1988 to 2005 following a straight line. And the next, we spend um, uh, the rest of the time trying to introduce trend into the data. So the reason we separate the data into agricultural and non-agricultural components is because Malawi's economy is predominantly agricultural. Uh, so what we, what, what, uh, and, and it's, uh, and the agricultural sector is predominantly uh, rain-fed, and we assume that uh, rainfall is predictable. There is adequate literature, actually, that rainfall is predictable in low-income countries. So we collected data from six weather stations uh, from the three regions of Malawi, the northern region, the central region, and the southern region. And each of the two weather stations, we collected data from a highland and a lowland. And we used this, da this data to construct weights for trending the agricultural component of the informal financial sector. Now for the formal financial sector, we assume that um, it, the, the credit is influenced by agricultural activities in the rural areas and industrial performance in the urban areas. Now for the component, for the rural component, we use tobacco production. Why do we use tobacco production? Again, it's because within the agricultural sector in Malawi, tobacco tends to be the mainstay of the economy. Uh, it accounts for about 50% of the exports of Malawi. So we use tobacco production and then we uh, uh, to train the, the rural component of credit, of non-agricultural credit, and then we use the index of industrial production to train the urban component of non-agricultural credit. Now, one thing that we also note is that um, the ratio of agriculture to industrial production does not remain the same over the entire period. Uh, so what we do is to use uh, tobacco production as a ratio of GDP for the agricultural component 
and the ratio of manufacturing to GDP for the non-agricultural component in order to pick uh, these changes over time. And then we use um, um, a weighted average of the two to train the non-agricultural component of the informal financial sector. And then at the end of the day, we sum the agricultural component and the, the non-agricultural component to come up with uh, informal financial, sorry, to come up with, yes, um, the informal financial sector credit. And this is the data that we have. Um, basically what we ended up is uh, the data that follows the dotted line and then we seasonal adjusted the data what that means is that we were removing um, uh, seasonal components and then we end up with the trend that follows the dark uh, board line now next what we do is to um, come up with a series of informal financial sector interest rates and to do this uh, what we do is uh, to start with st some stylized facts. What do we know about interest rates in the informal financial sector? Number one uh, is that interest rates in the semi-formal and the formal financial institutions will change together in the same direction. Now, the semi-formal sector includes microfinance, employers and the state owners, which we have lumped as part of the informal financial sector. And this part of the informal financial sector changes together with the formal financial sector. We assume that uh, microfinance, for example, um, uh, what they do is simply to load a margin over formal financial sector interest rates. And if you look at employers and the state owners, we assume that um, uh, they lend below the uh, official formal financial sector interest rates. Uh, another thing that we know is that interest rates on loans from money lenders, friends, relatives, neighbors, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they're determined by custom and traditional values. What do we know about this? We know that friends, relatives, neighbors, traders, et cetera, et cetera, do not charge interest on their loans. Why do, not, do they not charge interest on their loans? Because when they're lending to each other, they regard each other as a, a part of family, uh, what they would call Archibald. So Archibald is simply translated family and then each of these members have um, your under obligation to kind of retain some camaraderie uh, relationship among these people. And then if you go to money lenders, uh, there is adequate literature that the money lenders charge 100% interest. Um, in the words of Chimango, um, every pound makes another pound. But then when you are a money lender dealing with friends, relatives, and neighbors, you end up in a situation where uh, the interest rate goes down and it goes down significantly to 50%. Uh, now, when it goes down to 50%, it's referred to Mwala um, Kunchenga, which is translated a stone for sand. When it's 100% interest, it's referred to as Mwala Kumwala, which is translated a stone for a stone, which is basically what, re what we're referring to here as every pound makes another pound. Now we make two other simplifying assumptions. Number one, that total credit in the informal financial sector uh, varies according to the interpolation uh, carried out in the previous section. And then the proportion of credit uh, attributed to each market segment changed from the position reported in the Chipeta and with a survey to the case reported in the integrated household survey uh, two following a linear trend. So we break down uh, the informal financial sector into these six different credit islands. Why did we pick these? It's because we're able to identify the rates of interest in each of these different markets. Now, I'll not go into the technical details, but at the end of the day, we end up uh, with the upper chart, this line here, as representing the interest rates between the two periods that we interpolated. And we plotted that together with the formal financial sector interest rates, which is the chart that's on the lower part. Now, when you do this kind of analysis, the difficult part is 
at the end of the day is what you get, what you wanted to get. So we, we, we interrogate the data. Number one, we find out that our informal financial sector interest rate, interest rates are higher than the formal financial sector interest rates, which is consistent with what we expect. Uh, because the, normally the informal financial sector interest rates tend to be higher. Number two, you observe that the, flag, the, the more flag, fluctuations in the formal financial sector interest rates than in the informal financial sector interest rates. Again, um, uh, we know that, that that's expected, uh, particularly because in the formal financial sector, we also have elements of tradition and customary values coming in. Um, and then we also try to check uh, the correlation between the informal financial sector credit and the ratio of uh, cash to deposits. So if informal financial sector credit is increasing, you expect the cash deposit ratio to increase as well. And we found a significant and positive relationship. Now, the next thing that we do is to run a model where uh, the monetary authorities are using the formal financial sector uh, data and, uh, uh, and, and then in a separate case where they're also using informal financial sector data. Now, the problem that the monetary authorities face is that they use what are referred to as operating targets of monetary policy. In our case, we have the bank rate and reserve money and they're trying to achieve monetary policy goals, uh, which we have here as, um, um, inflation and output growth. The problem that they have is that whenever they change the monetary policy tools, the, the tools themselves do not directly affect the goals. They affect what we call intermediate targets of monetary policy here. And then the intermediate targets in turn affect the monetary policy goals. Now, unless they understand this transmission process, they are likely to get it wrong. And it gets more complicated when you bring in informal financial sector data. And in the case where you don't understand this transmission process, you end up with a black box here. So we used a, vec a structural vector auto regressive model. And these are some of the results that we end up with. Now, if you increase the repo rate um, or, or, or the bank rate, we, we find out that the official uh, form of financial sector interest rates go up as expected, uh, bank lending declines and output declines as expected. Um, but the informal financial sector loans do not change and total credit, which is the sum of uh, formal financial sector loans and informal financial sector loans do not change. Um, money, money supply decreases and output decreases again as expected, but informal financial sector interest rates do not, uh, do not change. Now, if we further interrogate what's happening in the informal financial sector, uh, if we try to um, uh, assume that there's an increase in informal financial sector interest rates, we notice that informal financial sector loans increase, total uh, loans in the informal financial sector increase, and output increases as well. Um, and then consumer prices increase while formal financial sector loans do not change. Now, what are the take home uh, messages from that? Number one, um, when you change the uh, bank rate, the lending in the formal financial sector changes, but the total, the total lending does not change. If there's any change, it's, it's insignificant so much so that if the authorities assume that by changing the repo rate or the base lending rate, uh, will they going to change the total loans? That does not happen. But then if you look at uh, if a case where you change the total loans, if the total loans increase, um, uh, output increases. In the, in the, in the first case, uh, since the total loans are not changing, we have no reason to believe that output is going to change significantly as expected by the monetary authorities. Um, we have summarized uh, what we are observing from there. Number one, that an increase in the formal financial sector loans and the formal financial sector loans, and then the sum of the two, which is total lending, leads to a significant increase in output. 
And the question that we ask is, what is the appropriate monetary policy to increase output? And you may argue that the appropriate policy would be to reduce the bank rate. So uh, if you reduce the bank rate, the base lending rate is going to decrease, uh, bank lending is going to go up and output is going to go up. But informal financial sector laws do not change total lending, which is the sum of um, uh, the, the, official, the formal financial sector loans and the formal financial sector loans do not change significantly as well. We end up with a question mark on what is it that exactly is going to happen. So you may end up with a situation where the change in output is insignificant. Uh, number two, we observe that uh, consumer prices increase following a shock or rather a, an unexpected change in the formal financial sector loans, informal financial sector loans, and total lending. In other words, we are able to see the complementarity effect. So if you increase total loans, consumer prices increase. And the same picture is observed here. The same direction that the bank loans change is the same direction that the consumer prices change. And now the question is, how do you reduce consumer prices? And you may find out that according to the money authorities, uh, it's simple, increase the bank rate. Now, if you increase the bank rate, you find out that the base lending rate is going to increase and uh, to, uh, lending in the form of financial sector decreases, but total loans do not decrease as such. And because there's no significant change in total loans, there's no expectation that there's going to be a significant change uh, in consumer prices. And number three, uh, we observe that output decreases following an increase in formal financial sector interest rates. And then output increases following an increase in informal financial sector interest rates. Now that we observe here, if you increase uh, the bank rate or the repo rate, you end up in a situation where output decreases. That's in the formal financial sector. If you're operating in the informal financial sector, you find out that uh, if you change interest rate, i.e. increase interest rates, output increases. So the change in output uh, occurs in different directions to the change in interest rates, whether you, when you are talking about the formal financial sector and when you're talking about the informal financial sector. If you increase interest rates in the formal financial sector, output decreases. If you increase interest rates in the informal financial sector, output increases. And at the end of the day, we argue that the impact of interest rates on output cannot be generalized. Now, here we come up with some conclusions. Number one, that formal financial, uh, in the formal, finan the formal financial sector and the informal financial sector variables may complement each other as we have, we have observed but they may also move in opposite directions. And as such, uh, if we exclude informal financial sector data and official monetary data, we are going to end up with wrong inferences um, of the monetary policy, of the impact of monetary policy tools on the monetary policy goals. And our suggestion is that central banks should start collecting informal financial sector data, but that's going to be something, a, a, a long-term project. Uh, in the short term, we suggest that uh, they should use interpolated data similar to what we have done. Uh, we find out that in certain instances, government has intervened um, by providing or by putting together policies where uh, players, especially agricultural players, are able to get cheap loans in the form of financial sector. And the expectation is when these agricultural uh, farmers are getting loans in the form of financial sector, instead of the informal financial sector, demand for loans in the informal financial sector is going to decrease. And then the interest rates in the informal financial sector are going to decrease. And at the end of the day, you're going to have interest rates in the formal and informal financial sectors equalized. The reality is this has not happened. And the question is why? Again, uh, we find out that since the interest rates in the formal financial sector are high and the interest rates in the for informal financial sector are relatively low, uh, 
why is it that individuals do not take advantage of these differences and borrow from the formal financial sector and on land in the informal financial sector up until interest rates in the informal financial sector decline? This again has not happened. Again, why has it not happened? Because these are issues that we still need to understand. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much um, for your attention. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Harold Ngalawa, for that insightful uh, uh, lecture. And congratulations on the delivery of this inaugural lecture. Just to touch on a few aspects of your lecture, the lecture had four parts in which you presented an outline, outline of background information, followed by a discussion on how the formal and informal sectors interact in quasi-emerging market economies and the consequent implications for monetary policy. You comprehensively presented an innovative approach for creating informal financial sector data using bits and pieces of existing data, indigenous knowledge, and a method suggested by Milton Friedman on how to generate missing data. The lecture concluded by stating that informal and informal credit markets interact in ways that are not uh, that obvious. For instance, you argue that although formal and informal financial sector loans may be substitute to borrowers, they are in fact complementary in the aggregate. Professor Angalawa, another takeaway from your lecture is that you also showed that interest rates in the informal financial sector are not necessarily driven by formal financial sector interest rates. It is clear from the presentation that the informal financial sector plays a non-trivial role in quasi emerging market economy. It is therefore safe to conclude that exclusion of informal financial transactions in, informal, in official monetary data may frustrate monetary policy through wrong inferences on the impact of monetary policy on economic activity. Thus, you recommended that low-income countries with large informal financial sectors should start compiling data for informal financial transactions. These data may include informal financial sector interest rates and loans, among others. In the short term, however, the lecture recommended that monetary authorities should use interpolated data for the inform informal financial sector using the available pieces of data like surveys, tradition, indigenous knowledge, and elements of Friedman's method of interpolating time series from related series. And thus adding the informal financial sector data to the formal financial sector data as official monetary data is likely to improve monetary policy formulation and implementation in these countries. With those words, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Professor Harold Ngalawa for the inaugural lecture. And to you guests, we really appreciate your attendance. Thank you very much.